Hi everyone, I'm Jean-Michel and thank you so much for joining us. Today we will be interviewing a AAA game veteran who's worked on the likes of Cyberpunk, Evolve and Just Cause 4, my friend, Mr. Steven Espion. Mr. Steven Espion, welcome to the show. How's it going? All good, man. Nice to speak to you again. It's always a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. So um, I know you, Stephen, as the as the um, uh, gentleman who left left behind a successful career in the traditional gaming space to to pursue his own journey. But I want to hear the 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 um, story from you for the first time, as if it's the first time, because it's it, it, it's always extremely interesting. So go ahead. Who are you, and what the hell do you do in the space? Uh, so I'm Stephen. I'm the CEO and creative director at Fracture Labs, my own company, uh, which is currently in development on a game called Decimated. Uh, we've got a team of 50 developers uh, working predominantly in Eastern Europe, but we've got developers all around the world. Um, and we're a traditional um, video game development company, but we've been using Web3 technology since about 2018. Um, and now we're almost ready for launch. So it, it's been quite a journey to get to this stage, uh, and I'm happy to to share more details about it. Okay, so you just you just sort of jumped jumped straight to the end, right? Which is you're 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 in a position where you you you're creating your own video game and essentially own your own video game company, right? But how did things start? What was your what's your what's your background? Uh, so well, before I actually worked in the games industry, I studied music technology and sound production. So I used to do electronic music professionally. I released uh, records and DJed and did live performances around the UK and uh, Europe and one time in Hong Kong as well. Um, I wanted to do music and sound design for video games. So in 2008, I got a job as a QA tester. It was my entry-level job in the games industry. Um, and I quickly went from QA to business development because I approached the, the manager and I was like, hey, I think that I could be actually doing sales and biz dev and networking because I'm really good at that. And I've already got a lot of experience doing that in the music industry, organizing events, booking DJs, you know, organizing marketing and PR, that kind of stuff. Um, and I think that, you know, I'm, I'm really good at networking. I'm like a master networker. So I, I transitioned from QA testing into biz dev and I was organizing testing and translation for this big company in Glasgow. That all, that's originally where I was living because you can hear from the accent, you know, Scottish. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, so we had we had like teams of QA testers in places like Bangalore, India. We had translators all over Europe that were translating video games and then and doing the voiceover in different video games. And we also had uh, our headquarters in uh, the US, I think Baltimore, Maryland, as far as I remember. So I did that for uh, a few months, and then I got headhunted by another company in the south of Spain to do pretty much the same job, uh, but they uh, they offered me a higher salary, and I felt like I wasn't appreciated at the first company I was working at because I was getting like really, really low salary, entry level, you know. Um, so I moved over to Spain, and I started working for this uh, QA and testing translation company, um, in Malaga, I uh, lived and worked there for two years, and I got a lot of experience with the whole uh, procedures and pipelines for testing games, translating games, doing voiceover for games, that kind of thing. But I wanted to get back into creative production. You know, as I said, you know, I was doing music production before. I wanted to get into sound design, so I wanted to make sure that my career was still on the right path and not just sales and business development. You know, so then I started working for this motion capture studio in Frankfurt, uh, two thousand and twelve. Um, now, this was, yeah, yeah, 2012. Um, and essentially what I was doing was I was organizing animation, cinematics, and VFX production for a lot of AAA game studios, including working on games like uh, Star Citizen. We worked on Evolve with 2K games. We worked on Batman Arkham Origins, uh, Borderlands 2, and several others. And these were all projects that I organized, and I was kind of involved with organizing the budgets and the timeline, sometimes recruitment and hiring up the team. And essentially I was able to bring quite a lot of business to this studio over in Frankfurt. Um, and I had a really great time working with those guys. But again, I still wanted to advance my career. And I wanted to kind of uh, really work with some of the highest quality video game studios in the world, you know, like Ubisoft. And we were already working with 2K games, but uh, Ubisoft and uh, Activision and, and, and uh, all these kind of other big studios. It was difficult for us to get those kind of uh, clients with the studio that I was working with. So I ended up working with this this other studio that were doing similar types of work, uh, animation, cinematics, VFX. Uh, they were predominantly doing pre-vis and post-vis for movies, such as uh, Star Wars. They did um, Wolverine, World War Z, and several other. They were they were doing kind of like adapting scripts into storyboards and then pre-vis, 
which is like early animation before where you get the, the actors on green screen. And I saw their portfolio on Vimeo and I was like, man, the, the work that you guys are doing is absolutely amazing. I've got lots of contacts in the video games industry. If you guys have got lots of experience working in movies, why don't we bridge our our collective skills together? We work together and set up a video game department and uh, I can help you do that. You know, I've got lots of contacts with game studios, with artists, with animators, that kind of stuff. So over the course of two, three years, actually, I helped scale up their video game side of their business there was certainly a bit of resistance from their traditional kind of movie side of the business they're like no why do we need this like let's just focus on movies let's that's our bread and butter let's just do that but obviously the ceo was really really keen to uh expand and, and kind of adapt and get into the kind of new world of using unreal engine 5 or unreal engine 4 at the time um and, and unity engine as well so unity was actually one of our clients uh we did some cinematics for those guys uh we did work with warner brothers on injustice 2 mortal kombat we did, did work with 2k games again on evolve <laughs> then they went on to do uh work with 2k games on uh xcom as well um, oh yeah xcom 2 yeah and then big projects right. like uh we did uh, just cause 4 we did hours and hours of content for Just Cause 4. <laughs> like everything, all the motion capture, all the in-engine integration, face animation, lighting and VFX, explosions, that kind of stuff. All of the kind of content in video games that drives the story forward in between the gameplay. Uh, but in some cases, for example, we were creating content that would be seamlessly uh, it, would, it would be seamless between the cinematic and gameplay. Like in uh, Dying Light, for example, that was one game where... You enter into a door, you speak to an NPC, they grab your character, your camera sw swings around, they put you into a chair, they'll like inject you with something, then you'll kind of fall unconscious, yeah. then you wake up and, you know, <laughs> like someone's slapping you in the face, and then you get out of the chair, and then it's like you continue playing the game. And this was all seamless. So exactly. we had to work with we had to work with the core dev team uh, with all the animation work that we were doing, as well as the programmers to make everything seamless. So I, get, I gained a lot of experience working in AAA game production, you know, across the board, from, like I say, from QA testing, localization, voiceover, then into motion capture, cinematics, lighting and VFX, uh, script development, storyboard development. And I was making a lot of money for these companies. And I thought to myself, man, I should be making my own games and like, you know, uh, working, like working on building up my own empire, you know. So um, I started working on my own project, my first project in 2014. It was kind of like a side project for me. Uh, supervised a small team of developers, uh, programmers, artists, animators, that kind of thing. Uh, we released our first game in 2016, and it was it was not successful, but it was a learning experience. You know, we used Unity. We cre created a game called Hide and Shriek Mansion, which was the, uh, two teams of players running around this cartoon mansion, uh, where one team of players have got to try and steal paintings and vases and things like that, and also uh set set uh, they've got to like hack safes and they've got to like hack computers and things like that whereas the other team of players are trying to stop them doing this by setting traps and using the cctv camera to find out where they are in the in the in the, the building um and it was like kind of this cartoon style gameplay so we're actually planning to reboot that franchise in the near future after this project we're working on now um so decimated now the second project that i've worked on uh of my own and it's taken me five years to uh basically get through the kind of startup death valley uh, and now up to the stage of uh, progress where we're actually, we've got more than 50 developers and, you know, we're generating revenue and, uh, you know, we've raised capital and we're almost ready for launch. So, yeah, that's, it's been a, it's that, been a, it's been a yeah, journey. It's been a hell of a ride, man. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a lovely way to put it, I think, like startup death value, because re really, I mean, the first, the first couple of years, if you're trying to do... <clears throat> anything with 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 any sort of scale or have any kind of real real impact that's exactly what the first few few years of your business are death value yeah. right yeah, exactly <laughs> so it makes yeah. so it makes um, a perfect sense but now you're 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 um you're on to the um, decimated project and and um um before i ask you this question i just want to i want to allude to something which is the 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 loading screen mechanic, which you mentioned earlier. So Dying Light, coincidentally, I was just playing Dying Light 2 last night. Um, I'm like 70 hours in, I think, something like that. Um, uh, and it does have a really interesting mechanic, right? That, 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 that um, uses, uses a sort of video or a cutscene as part of a loading mechanism in between, 
in between um, different physical locations uh, um, sometimes um, just as a, as, a, as, a, as a way to make that loading screen m m more interesting, right? Rather than have a simple video or, or, or something that's not interactive, right? This is, this, is, this is a nice way to keep the user's sort of patience um, aligned while, while, while the game is allowed to progress at, at a um, technical level. So my, and that was a, that, that's a hell of an innovation. So my question to you is, um, what other kinds of innovations along this scale are you, do you foresee being implemented within, within your game Decimated? That's a good question, actually. There's a lot of things, obviously, that are uh, currently on the forefront of everybody's minds with regards to Web3 technology and AI as well. So um, I think... I mean, we can. Web three is something that I, was, uh, I might not have mentioned before, but we've been using Web three technologies since the early days, since two thousand eighteen. Um, we tried it, we tested with it, we took a break, and then we decided to work with it again when we felt like the market had caught up with the idea of GameFi and and Web three games. You'll probably remember that I was, uh, you know, shilling the concept of Web three games back in two thousand eighteen and largely met with either laughter or or skepticism you know but it took the market several years to catch up and now everyone's a web3 uh, game developer apparently you know so even though they don't have any experience or they don't have so this is obviously this is obviously one thing you know like being able to use web3 technology for provable digital scarcity uh, and also transfer of ownership between users um one thing that I'll be honest about is that we're not building a decentralized video game where uh you know it's just connecting up your wallet and you, you can play the game you can earn some you can buy some tokens you can earn some tokens and it's like you disconnect from the game you disconnect from your wallet it's still uh because of the amount of tech that's involved and all the server tech that's involved with running a game like decimated an open world persistent open world survival game um we have a centralized back end but with the deposit and withdrawal functionality so that users can they have the option to take their tokens or their virtual items out of the game and out of their game wallet onto the secondary market and then be able to trade them uh, on you know exchanges like uh, OpenSea, for example, where there's obviously hundreds or you know hundreds of thousands of uh, monthly active users. So there's a lot of potential there. But another thing that I want to touch on was AI. Everybody's talking about AI right now. Everybody's starting to create startups which are um, you know giving AI access to your knowledge base, or in our case as a game developer giving the AI access to our game design documentation, right? So that even people on in our internal team can write on Discord, rather than asking me or one of the lead developers how to solve a problem, they'll be able to use the AI, which has access to all the knowledge base, and we'll give them an answer immediately because it already knows, it's, it's crawled all of the information and confluence that we've, where we store all of our data, you know? Give me an example of that in a, in a little bit more of a... Of a concrete fashion, so 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 let's say there's a by issue. You mean a, a technical issue? So there's like something which the um, devs are working on, is it, or is it a bug which the users find? How are you seeing this? It could be for anything. I mean, the way I see it is that uh, AI can be used for um, it can be used in three ways for for video games like ours. The first way is like I just explained. You know, uh, internal use. It has access to all of our documentation that all of the developers have contributed to the project over the last five years. That includes game concepts, st uh, lore, lore of the game, uh, technical requirements, uh, you know, how everything is set up with animation trees, you know, programming, naming conventions, all that kind of stuff. So if somebody new joins the team, rather than burden other, the, other developers with all the questions that they've got because they're new, they could basically have a channel where they can ask this AI you know, how how do the decimated team do this, for example? And then it will tell them exactly. And it will reword it in a way that's comprehensible. Uh, so that's one way that it can be used. The second way is uh, you give the AI access to your knowledge base, which is public facing, right? So your community, you're always asking questions, you know, when Lambo, when Moon, you know, and when when when's the game, when's the game coming out, you know? Um who can I speak to about a marketing partnership and all these kind of things, you know? You could have an AI that has access to your knowledge base and all of your frequently answered and frequently asked questions so that AI can answer for you and it saves you the cost of paying for people who, uh, you know, need to go and look up that information and then answer correctly or come to me and say, hey, Stephen, we've got a lot of people in the community asking us, you know, this question, what should we answer them? And I'm like, let's come up with an answer, put it in the knowledge base and then let the AI do all the work. 
So the third thing that AI can be used for in video games, now this I think you're going to really like, as I mentioned before, you can give AI access to your lore. So let's say you've got writers, they're writing your entire backstory. In our case, they're writing, they've written a, like 160 years worth of lore about how Earth became so decimated in the decimated world, you know? What happened? Okay, there was like climate change, there was industrialization, there was the rise of artificial intelligence, and, you know, uh, the artificial intelligence became self-aware, and then it realized that humans had destroyed the planet, and so it started to try take control, and the humans obviously didn't like that so they cause an uprising and then there was it's just a big kind of conflict between humans and ai so what does the ai do in response it creates this cyborg police force to try and police all the humans so we've written all of that it's like 160 years worth of lore so the idea is cheers i mean it's is my vision of what the future is going to be like to be honest you know so basically decimated is like my vision of the future at about 160 years from now so what what people have asked us is, are you going to use AI technology for your NPCs inside the game? And I'm like, that's a brilliant idea. Because what we can do is we can give the AI algorithm access to our uh, our lore, and we can add more lore to it. You know, we can get it deeper and deeper, more complex, like the Aliens franchise, the Predator franchise, the Terminator franchise. Like over years, they become more and more detailed, and you've got like a much, much deeper history uh, with names of characters, names of places, all that kind of stuff. So essentially, you can have... AI-driven NPCs that the players can ask questions to either by typing or speaking to, and then the AI will respond to them and tell, like, let's say a player goes up to an NPC and says, why why is there a big ship crashed on those cliffs over there? And the AI will be able to tell you, well, actually, back in 2147, there was actually, they were experimenting with, like, uh, teleportation technology, and it, it, it got messed up, and that ship it basically appeared there. Uh, and it killed all the crew on board, but like uh, apparently <laughs> there's some secrets in there you can go and find, you know. So yeah, you know, that, yeah. that's a, that's actually a really really good example. Uh, I wasn't I wasn't I wasn't expecting something like that to be honest. Um, <laughs> uh, but to your point, to your point, um, and this is like I think it has a, a lot of potential for ways which might not be so directly obvious i.e like one of the things i think that makes makes gamers kind of unique is because we like to break stuff it's just it's just what we do right it's just we like to find the the limits and the extremities of things and see how far we can push things by default so as an example there was a um uh, back in the world of warcraft days uh, there was there was a, there was a mace called the unstoppable force, and there was a shield called the immovable object. And just to, literally, just to have fun, we used to open customer care tickets, speak with guild masters, and just, like, like w as soon as the guild master finally gives you some time of day, just, just what's, what's your question, sir? Like, what happens when the unstoppable force hits the immovable object? Uh, <laughs> and you just get some random answer from this GM that you screenshot, share with your friends, and everyone has a great time. Because it's, 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 so I think you, you might, there might be some of that sort of possibility for, for comic value as well, yeah. right? And, 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 and yeah. inside, it's, it's a great Easter egg repository is what it is. Yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> right? Yeah. Good idea. Um, yeah, it's, 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 uh, but, but at the same time, to your point, it's also, it's also, um, it could be, it could be a completely new and engaging way for, for, for people to interact with, with NPCs, in-game NPCs, not, not IRL NPCs, um, and for the audience that, that don't get that joke, um, yeah, that's on you. Um, <laughs> um, well, anyway, so, so, um, decimated sounds like a, like a, like a hell of a vision, um, what what element about the game are you most excited about at the moment? Yeah, so when, when we show people what we're building and we tell people what we're working on, and I do prefer to show rather than tell because there's a lot of people that will tell you about their vision and their, their idea without actually having anything behind it. Um, you know, I prefer to share our videos of the gameplay and all the stuff that we're working on, and not just the video game, but also what some people might call a metaverse. Now, this is a new term that, you know, we, we were developing this game long before this became a buzzword. But when we describe it to people, they say, wow, it sounds like you guys are actually creating like a real metaverse where you can buy property and you can have your own vehicle and you can customize your character. And I'm like, 
Well, yeah, I mean, it's a video game. That's what you're able to do in video games. Like Grand Theft Auto V, for example, you can earn a certain amount of, of credits and then you can buy a cool mansion on the on the hills or you can buy a garage, a safe house, that kind of stuff. So this is what I'm really looking forward to. What we're What we're building is a virtual real estate system in this cyberpunk world where it's not just about doing missions and uh, competing against other players for the virtual currency rewards or, or items. Um, it's also about being able to buy your own property, which has got a really amazing view of this Blade Runner-esque city. And if you want, you can customize it as much as you want. You can choose where the furniture is. You can choose what color the walls are, et cetera, et cetera. And it's all stylistically, uh, you know, Cyberpunk 2077 and Blade Runner inspired, Deus Ex, those kind of things, you know. Um, so I'm really looking which are games that, that because... you coincidentally worked on, which is hilarious. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I mean, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that, and that's something that we're we're currently uh, almost ready to launch this year. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is something that you know, in, in other games, you might be able to buy a virtual apartment or something like that, like in GTA. But in ours, you can actually customize it, and you can sit in it in VR. You can invite your friends over, and they can edit. You can give them edit access. So you can both move furniture around. You can put NFT artwork on the wall, that kind of stuff. So I'm really looking forward to that. This is this is what I think is kind of like the next generation of video games where it's like more, because you think about it, right? What are the most popular platforms in the world? Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, where the users are able to create their own content, you know, and then they're like the, the protagonist of their own life online. And then they get validation from other people that give them likes and comments and like, oh, wow, what a great photo or whatever, you know. In our game, you can do the same thing it's like more of a personal thing it's not just buying a vehicle or buying uh, an apartment you can actually customize it and then make it look like your own personal item you know but then if you want to sell it you can sell it to somebody else if you like to you know so yeah yeah no the the like the idea of 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 to your to your sort of previous point the idea of uh, yeah yeah are you building a metaverse you can buy and sell uh, like People just don't get that we've been doing this for the last God knows how many years, right? Like the word, if you're a gamer, meta is is something we've been yep. saying for a, for a long time that the world's finally yep. woken up to. And the nerds yep. are just sitting around and looking, looking at everyone else like, you idiots, you have no idea what you're <laughs> doing, like, right? So, so, so I find that really funny, but it, it also means exactly like you said, right? It, it means saying something without showing it in, in, in your position is very very risky because the 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 you know the the snake oil peddlers and the visionaries sound kind of the same that's just that's just mm -hmm. the reality and that's why we're in this nft mess and this crypto mess that we're that we're um, currently in so i like the fact that you that you that you're sort of uh, on the, on the on the on the show rather than the uh, mattel side um to the to the um um on the Web3 front, though, specifically, um, it's like you mentioned the idea of, 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 of uh, like linking up um, OpenSea, um, uh, um, for example, right? As a, as a, as a secondary marketplace. Um, do you see that as some, like, knowing now sort of the reputation that the, that, that the Web3 space has um, in a, from a siloed perspective, right? And what tra traditional gaming thinks about that, that Web3 space. At the moment, they're like, they're, they're, they're like fire and ice, right? Yeah. Um, how uh, does that scare you at all? How do you, how do you think that's going to that's gonna work? Yeah, it definitely does. I mean, obviously, as I said, when I started this project, it was way before anybody else was doing uh, Web3 games and GameFi and Metaverse projects. Um, and it obviously took the rest of the world to, or at least a section of the world to catch up to the idea that, wow, gaming could actually potentially be the path to mass adoption of, of blockchain technology. But obviously, yes, still, there's a lot of resistance from predominantly the gamers themselves. I think that back in 2021, there was definitely some interest from the traditional video game investors and publishers and some uh, companies like Ubisoft and Square Enix and, uh, and, and Tencent, for example. Um, but then, obviously, with the market crash and FTX and Alameda uh, going insolvent, becoming insolvent, um, it scared everybody off again, you know. So now they're back into the we're, we're not bullish on Web3 technology anymore. But I think that these are kind of like 
uh, trends, you know, like they come in, in into fashion, they go out of fashion. Uh, I think that people do get scared off by uh, the grifters in the space, the volatility. But I do think that there's still a place uh, for Web3 technology to be used in gaming. I don't think that it's going to revolutionize the games industry. I don't think it's going to like make traditional games obsolete. And people ask me this kind of question. They're like, so do you think that like in a few years from now, uh, Web3 games are going to completely replace and destroy the traditional Web2 gaming market and all these big companies that currently exist are going to be obsolete? And I'm like, absolutely not. No way. Because they have all the money and they've got all the expertise and they've got all the sense, you know, to to know how to use it and how not to use it. So at the moment, I think there's a lot of sitting on the fence and waiting for companies like ours or the Sandbox or, uh, you know, the Shrapnel um, off the grid and projects like that, that you can consider, you know, real real high quality, legit AAA or, or uh, you know, uh, casual games, for example. Um they're, we're going to be the ones that are going to be uh, at the forefront and kind of leading the way, taking the risks. We're like the kites in the wind, you know, like assessing the risk, dealing with the lawyers and the regulators and that kind of stuff. And and obviously with your token out there as well, it's like there's all these big companies that are watching to see how token volatility affects in-game economies as well. It's like a, it's like a huge thing, you know. So, um, of course, like in the traditional gaming space, right, you've got like uh, you've got premium games that have like a single player uh, narrative. I don't think that Web3 is going to replace those. People are still going to want to buy a game that they play for eight hours and they do like a linear story. You're going to have free to play games where free to play games where um, uh, it's free to play, but there's in game transactions similar to our game as well. Um, and then you're going to have premium games like Call of Duty, where you pay 60 bucks, and then you can download downloadable content, for example, that kind of stuff. All of that is still going to exist, but I think that there's going to be an addition of Web3 technology as uh, as a plug-in, you know, the option to also be able to trade your virtual items with other players securely, potentially inside the publisher's network, uh, like you play for Ubisoft or Rockstar Social Club, for example, um, and then potentially on the secondary market like OpenSea or SolSea or whatever. So uh, I think that um, you're going to have lots of separate islands of like PlayStation, Microsoft, Ubisoft, Activision. It's going to be always the way that it is now. So, so yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, um, on the, on the web three side, um, in the case of the internet, web two ate web one and web, web three will eat web, web two. In the case of gaming, I think, Multiplayer didn't kill single player, it only created a separate avenue. And Web3 will be its own third third new new avenue. And, and all of them will live, will live in harmony. I think there's different audiences for, 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 for different types of games. But um, Stephen, this has been um, absolutely enlightening. Thank you so much for your time. I think we had a, we had a lovely conversation. Um, uh, and wish you the best of luck with the um, Decimate project.